Paul Curtis, and I have the pleasure and honor of introducing our seminar speaker today, Dr. Keith Sidball. Keith wears many different hats, and uh, probably you're only aware of one or two that are associated with the department. Well, I just want had to make a list. He does so many different things. I want to run down. He's a senior extension associate in the department, assistant director for environment and natural resources with cooperative extension with Robert Paul. He's the state. Uh, coordinator for the New York Extension Disaster Education Network, or EDEN. He's the director of the Civic Ecology Lab. He works with military families and veterans and coordinated many wounded warrior projects for them. That's just sort of a start to see. I don't know how he does it all, to be honest. Um, his applied research and extension interests are probably in conservation and development of land efforts. He's been involved with uh, R3 initiatives with uh, state wildlife agencies. That's the recruitment, retention, re-engagement, and outdoor enthusiasts. Our paths missed we crossed uh, two years ago on a local board project in the Finger Lakes. We were looking at the way people uh, procure and consume local fish and game. And today he's going to talk with us about the human nature and human in nature novel relations in the Anthropocene. So I'll turn it over to you, Keith. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, one minor correction. I'm no longer uh, working with the Civic Ecology Lab, although that was an important part of a lot of this work, and I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to be doing that with Marianne Krasny. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I enjoy wearing a lot of the hats that you heard about because it helps me do what I think of as engaged scholarship and extension. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The talk is Human Nature and Humans in Nature. Well, this is on. I will speak louder. I have the capability. Um, just want to make sure that all the sound is good. So the slide won't advance. Yeah, there we go. All right. So. I hope you can hear me and I will I will sound off. And if anybody has any further issues, I'll sound off more. I apologize for people in the first three rows. So um, as Paul said, 50% of my uh, appointment here at Cornell is in DNRE. The other half is at, 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 at CCE over in Roberts Hall where I have a, a, another office. Of that 50% that's here in the Department of Natural Resources though, about, I'm about a 50-50 split in research and, and extension. Uh, my background is in social science, uh, predominantly anthropology, especially environmental anthropology. Um, in the last 10 or 15 years, I've been doing more in environmental psychology and with the help of Rich, have uh, dabbled some in, in rural sociology, environmental sociology, as, as I'll dis discuss a little bit further. Um, from the standpoint of my philosophical or epistemological approach to the work that I'm going to share with you today, um, I, I am very committed to engaged environmental social science and uh, the framework of social ecological systems thinking. I, I think of my work in a framework of human dimensions, human dimensions plus, which I'll, which I'll get into a little bit. On the sort of theoretical and empirical side of, of what I'm doing, uh, I've been chasing this, this rabbit for about 12 years now, the search to identify and describe social mechanisms of resilience as, as Berkus and Folke described them early on sort of um, fathers of, of uh, social, eco, social ecological systems resilience thinking. And uh, on the engaged or extension side, um, identifying and illuminating pathways and portals into a 21st century land ethic. One thing I wanted to point out uh, that, that some of you who aren't familiar with the you know, various iterations of faculty in, in Cal's departments is that the senior extension associate is a useful tool uh, or can be a useful tool. Uh, hopefully not tool in the pejorative sense, but I'm talking about a Swiss Army knife where we can hopefully provide uh, pathways and portals into extension and engagement and actually serve as, as Henrik Ernsten called it, scale crossing brokers when it comes to the research, extension, outreach, and engagement that we want to do. Um, a little foreshadowing in the, in the photograph, I, I serve on a federal advisory committee uh, on, on conservation and outdoor recreation. Uh, advising the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Interior. That photograph is taken there at, um, at the Department of Interior. And I will be talking a little bit about 
uh, charismatic megafauna and what I call provocative social ecological symbols. Um, I'd like to figure that one out. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the workspace, the, the, my sort of approach to the, the applied work that I'm doing. So it's about attitudes, beliefs, motivations, behaviors, and relationships. And sort of the broad questions that I'm focused on are how do people see themselves in, in the biosphere or in the ecosphere? How do people situate themselves in social ecological systems? How these self-perceptions of our ecological identities actually scale or maybe don't scale? And what do they mean in terms of behavior? Also interested in, in knowing whether there are opportunities for shaping these social ecological self-perceptions or identities, and if so, when and how. Obviously, there is a concern about what function they play in the broader social ecological system and its resilience and, and, and maybe some management implications for all of that. So for today, um, things that I hope you'll, you'll walk away with. First, I hope you'll, you'll be provoked a little bit about some of the scholarship around, and my scholarship uh, predominantly, around humans and nature and ecological identities, especially in the context of these climate narratives. Secondly, I hope you'll, you'll just be as excited as I am about some of what I'll share regarding this applied work in the department having to do with the Adirondack Fisheries Research Program. And thirdly, I hope you'll also see a version of extension and, and extension faculty that reflects the possibilities and promise of, of these new priorities and, and focus areas in these campus to county partnerships that are so important now in the, in the 21st century. So, um, with the provocation. This, anybody familiar with this book? This is a, this is an interesting sort of science fiction piece that came out right after World War II, really grappling with how we can think about and talk about ourselves different than the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, roughly translated, the denatured animals, um, many book translations of that, most popular being You Shall Know Them, and there was then a movie uh, starring Burt Reynolds uh, with this, this, this book, and then I think um, it was also pushed into a, a play and not that long ago. Looks like somebody wants to get in. Are you able to admit? Okay. Uh, so the, sort of the, the big takeaway message I've, I've taken from this book after having read it in a couple of different iterations and seen the movie is this, this statement that all of our troubles arise from the fact that we do not know what we are and do not agree on what we want to be. So this is a bit of a foreshadowing provocation having to do with our ecological identities and how they might play out in um, climate narratives and other things. We might be dying on this thing. So the, the big question uh, that we'll, we'll be focused on today is this question of what's beyond the, dimension, the human dimensions of natural resources management? What are the human dimensions of the health and resilience of social ecological systems. In other words, what is human nature? What does being human in nature actually mean in the 21st century or the Anthropocene? So I have a hypothesis. This is, this is a way to organize um, the way I then reach into the uh, engaged work that I am doing. It starts with what I term ecological amnesia. Um, we forgot. We forgot how to be who we are in ecosystems. And there are, there's lots of evidence with this in, in loss of indigenous knowledge, which is being documented now, loss of experiential knowledge. In fact, uh, Rich and a few of, of, of us were just commenting on a, an interesting uh, documentary about old guide systems and old guide lifeways in the North Country, which are all going by the wayside. Loss of formative time outdoors. Um, Richard Lube's interesting and compelling book about uh, Last Child in the Woods. Many very uh, variations of, of ecological amnesia, which then leads to loss of ecological identity. We end up in this, and we've heard these narratives, we've heard these gods and demons narratives where either we situate ourselves as lording over all that is created, um, all that is under our domain, or, or hath dominion, or we hear narratives where we cast ourselves as toxic uh, viruses, came from somewhere else, I don't know where, didn't evolve with the rest of the system. Both of those are problematic because they situate us in anthropocentric, uh, highly hubris-oriented uh, positions 
which aren't, aren't necessarily helpful as we think about ecological identities and the implications. And one of the results of this is that we seem to have adopted a mindset where we've uh, ascended um, through our technology, through these digital spaces. So that leads to ecological disenfranchisement, where we become estranged from our own biology, and there are alarm signals happening now uh, in, in essays and so forth in, in science and in, in Scientific American about coevolution potentially being compromised by, by this disenfranchisement, which is interesting. <clears throat> if you haven't read some of these things, I encourage you to take a look. And ultimately, that leads to this notion of toxic anthropocentrism, where we see today policy and governance um, actions are not doing very well when it comes to the problem of biodiversity threat, uh, loss of biodiversity threat, uh, multiple extinctions, obviously the climate challenge that we face today. Oh, with those sort of hypothetical ideas in mind, There is this growing consensus that the key to surviving in the Anthropocene is escaping anthropocentrism. And that provides, in, 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 in the engaged work that I'm going to share with you, an opportunity to reframe resilience a fair bit and get away from hierarchical ways of thinking and ways of knowing and ways of talking about what we know into uh, more comprehensive, uh, more systems oriented framing. So, those. Folks in the audience who are working with me as students will have seen some of this before. Um, I think that it's really important for us to spend a little time disentangling the problems around SES and the hyphen and, and make, make the point that language matters. The, I think there's a real danger and a real risk in being imprecise with, when we throw around these terms. Um, I, I agree with Berkus and Polky, and again, if you're not familiar with those folks, um, they were part of the you know, OG, if you will, Resilience Alliance before it became the Stockholm Resilience Center. I consider them colleagues, friends, and mentors, and I agree that the delineation between social and natural systems is artificial and arbitrary, especially when it comes to uh, thinking about management. They uh, talk about why specifically and precisely they use social hyphen ecological systems as a term. <clears throat> and the, the, you see on the bottom left, they were uh, expressly and, and explicitly trying to get away from this term socio hyphen ecological systems because it's got problems. Some of those problems are um, that it reinforces this sort of dichotomous notions between social and ecological. And then somehow arbitrarily, we talk about what that overlap space is supposed to look like. <clears throat> and it also, according to them, the socio hyphen as a modifier implies something less than an equal status or a co-status within this larger system. Then you've got this other idea, which is being thrown around as a synonym often, as a socio-ecological system, this notion of a coupled or linked social and ecological. <clears throat> All of these are flawed heuristics in some way, but this one I think is particularly flawed in that we don't understand or can't ever know what that coupling or that linkage actually is uh, and, 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 and who's in charge of it. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I have a, a farm as an a, a vocation and as a way of living out what I believe in and think. And I have tractors and I have implements and I know what a coupling is. I know what a chain is. I know what happens when you, when you can or cannot add the implement to the tractor. But what's unclear in the social and ecological coupled uh, verbiage is exactly what are those couplings and those linkages, and how did we get to the point, if ever, where there was a completely distinct social system and ecological system? So, <clears throat> moving from that, the the sort of those troubles, those problems with those models, is the social hyphen ecological system model, wherein the social is embedded fully in the eco ecosystem, and therefore, um, we can escape some of these uh, anthropocentric problems with that embeddedness. It is much easier for us to visualize and talk about ourselves as humans in nature rather than coupled to nature, linked to nature, or socio, socio ecologically uh, oriented. That's important because it helps us think through this larger comprehensive 
issue of, of, of getting out of those hierarchical models, which don't seem to be helping. And it also helps remind us of that, that moment when um, those astronauts first looked in the rearview mirror back at the biosphere and that life-changing, world-changing couple of photographs that resulted. There are a number of fields that are delving into this uh, and exploring this from various perspectives. You've got most of them there. Um, <clears throat> we're not gonna belabor that right now, but I'd be happy to have conversations with you about those if you're interested. Getting down now to the, you know, and also just uh, letting everybody know, working our way away from the theoretical and, and philosophical to the more applied, this gets to the mechanisms that I mentioned in the, in the beginning. Um, Berkus and Polky said that systems that demonstrate resilience to peer have learned to recognize feedback and therefore possess mechanisms. Mechanisms by which information from the environment can be received, processed, and interpreted. So they're going beyond just this recognition that people are part of ecological systems. They're actually talking about exploring the means or social mechanisms that can bring about adaptations in social ecological systems that are perturbed by disaster, by war like we are right now in Europe, or other perturbances like uh, existential crises such as climate change. So these mechanisms are kind of the organizing theory within this larger social ecological systems framework. So moving from that, and this will kind of be the escape route from all of this theory uh, and, and, and philosophical and into the applied. I don't know if you're familiar with Sinner and company and their work. Uh, this is the diagram up on the left. Um, they're doing some great work in on understanding the domains of social factors within social ecological systems thinking. And they've accounted for these six domains. You can see them. We're, we're not gonna dive into every one of those. Uh, agency, assets, flexibility, organization, learning, socio-cognitive, all of those sort of working together in a system, um, lifting up this, this notion of adaptive capacity, which is an indicator of resilience. But the one I want to focus on is the socio-cognitive. And the socio-cognitive is where uh, ecological identities live. And the ecological identities are, are constantly being shaped and formed by forces. <clears throat> and mechanisms of social ecological systems resilience are at play in that ecological identity sphere within the sociocognitive domain. Three mechanisms that some of you may have heard me talk about, at least a couple of these before from this podium. One of them is urgent biophilia. Another is restorative tropophilia. And the third is the provocative social ecological icons that I mentioned. So quickly, just to spin through what these things are, urgent biophilia, is the immediate urge to express affinity with the rest of nature, often under times of stress, trauma, or loss. And I, I described this in this 2012 paper here by the same name, uh, and I've talked about it in a number of other publications since that time, and I'm currently exploring applying urgent biophilia to um, post-COVID park usage and so forth. The, the, the image on the left, I think it's interesting that I was, I was notified by a colleague of mine, a student of mine, in fact, and they said, hey, did you know that there's a painting titled Urgent Biophilia? I had not, not known that. I inquired with that artist about that and asked her, where, where did you come up with that term? And she said, well, I heard it from Sue Stewart Smith when she was doing a book talk for her book. And I was aware that, you know, Dr. Stewart Smith uses uh, Urgent Biophilia to, to make some of the cases for the Well Garden Mind. But I then reached out to her and she said uh, that the reason that she's talking about urgent biophilia is because it's a, it's a good way to enter the space of trying to situate humans in nature rather than humans outside of or in a dichotomous relationship with nature. And as a result of finding out about this painting, um, I'm happy to say that uh, <clears throat> I hope that we'll be able to have Dr. Stuart Smith here in the fall to talk a little bit more about her work and its relationship to, to some of this work. So, you know, news at 11 on that. Moving from urgent biophilia to restorative topophilia. <clears throat> this one, uh, it actually originated in a duck blind with uh, Dr. Stedman and Dr. Tantillo and myself. Uh, we, we, we kicked this idea around for a while, which ended up being a major part of this paper, Positive Dependency and Virtual Cycles. It was then um, explored and, and, and some depth was provided with uh, one of Rich's graduate students at the time now with a PhD, Micah Ingalls, in chapter 10 of the Greening in the Red Zone edited volume that I did with um, uh, Dr. Krasny. 
and then later we explored in, in even greater depth in the, in the book we co-wrote, Civic Ecology. And the idea of restorative tocopheli is that it, it, it serves as a powerful base for individual and collective action that repairs and or enhances social ecological attributes of place. And that's an important potential social mechanism, that a uh, social mechanism of ecological, social ecological systems, because it, it plays a kind of yin-yang role with the, with the idea of urgent biophilia. It, it can actually work to augment that. But one of the things that is that I, I mentioned here a couple of years ago and that I've been puzzling on for some time now is, you know, often ritual and symbol will play a role in that yin and yang relationship of urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia. And there we have this notion of provocative social ecological icon. Now, the idea of this should not be foreign to most of you. We've all, some of us will remember the timber wars of the spotted owl 30 years ago now, I guess. Um, <clears throat> that was immensely important because that spotted owl became a very, very potent social ecological symbol. We are currently experiencing the, the, the travesties of, of rhino poaching for their horn and the double tragedy of them having to cut the horns off in order to prevent the poaching. Um, that's that's uh, a very powerful provocative social ecological icon when it comes to stimulating interest and action away from rhino poaching. The, the, the you know, almost ridiculous idea now of the polar bear, which we saw in the introductory slides, um, having trouble in terms of its habitat in the Arctic as a result of climate change. And then of course, you know, we, we, we're all familiar with the panda uh, from the World Wildlife Fund and the, and the very couple different whales over the years that saved whales have used. All of these in the deployment of this, of this provocative social ecological symbol that is intended to actually provoke action and challenge these socio-cognitive constructs like our own personal experiences, like our cognitive biases, and like our perceived social norms, however uh, ephemeral some of those can be. So I'm sure you're relieved. We're moving now away from all of that theoretical and philosophical stuff to the more practical and applied and through the brook trout. Um, I don't have to make the case that the brook trout is iconic. The Eastern Brook Trout Venture and lots of other brook trout loving organizations are doing this already. And in this quote, they say, the wild brook trout is an iconic symbol of pristine waters as it's only found in the healthy streams, rivers, lakes, and ponds, et cetera. What I think is interesting as an opportunity, as an empirical opportunity and as an extension and engaged scholarship opportunity is the brook trout is a little different than some of these larger charismatic megafauna or the landscapes that as my daughter Charlotte pointed out, who's a student in this department, you know, these are all from landscapes that people generally don't go to, but brook trout aren't. Brook trout are right, right up the road in many cases. And so there's some interesting opportunities here in, ter in terms of this kind of um, provocative social ecological icon. So how would we apply that here? And, and what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about is, well, we're gonna, we're gonna think about using it in the context of what climate narratives actually look like especially the narratives among some of the most difficult to reach people, those being rural, rural folks in the state of New York, in the Adirondacks, anglers, hunters, et cetera. So that's, that's where we're headed with this. And from here, I wanna share with you uh, a, a program, a project that is, I guess you could say it just wrapped up because it was only a year's worth of funds, but, um, Pete McIntyre and, and Cliff and others in AFRP and myself are working a couple of different angles and a couple of different proposals to see if we can continue some of this work and other work uh, having more specifically to do with the fisheries themselves. Uh, in any case, this is a Cornell Cooperative Extension Innovation Funded Project, the Climate Change Education Through Cold Water Fisheries Extension Project. And the idea was a couple of things. We wanted to shine a brighter light on what's happening at AFRP in this department and do some fisheries extension, which I think is long overdue. We also wanted to do, uh, I in particular wanted us to, to play around with some preliminary research and interviewing and so forth on, on climate narratives as it relates to um, this consumptive uses. So the climate change, I apologize if that menu is sort of covering that up. This, this project is focused on narrative. And as we probably know by now, informing climate change narrative is being stated without equivocation as one of the most, if not the most critical missions of cooperative extension right now. 
This is, goes to the highest levels. This goes to Chris Watkins, who's Director of Cooperative Extension, and it goes to our relatively new dean. This is important. But as I'm thinking about this from where I sit in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment, this is going to be particularly challenging given some of the political discourse right now, especially given some of the, the conservative views that you may find among sportsmen and women. And so that may be one of the most challenging uh, objectives is how we inform climate change narratives among those, among those groups. So just to backtrack a little bit on, on what we're talking about here as it relates to ecological identities and ecological amnesia and all those things I talked about in my hypothetical, here's what's wrong slide. These uh, climate change narratives are very, very important because they reflect worldviews and they, they are how people communicate their own polarization, their own fear of, of echo chambers in their individual and their community level uh, climate change narratives. This paper, if you haven't seen it, is, is really useful. Again, um, I'm happy to share any of these slides and, and the references. Um, I did include hyperlinks to most of them if somebody wanted them later. So this, this paper is sort of where, where I'm basing this climate narrative uh, little uh, hitting the waves top section here that we're gonna do right now. Um, first, for those of you that aren't familiar, climate change narratives do reflect ecological identities. And they also represent people's understandings of the climate change issue, both the political and the scientific. So we need to pay attention to those climate narratives. <clears throat> and despite all the science, and we all know this very well, um, pointing to consensus around climate change and its causes, the, the narratives range, I mean, it's, it's amazing, the range of the narratives from outright disbelief and calling those of us that uh, are interested in engaged, involved, in it as a part of a left-wing hoax, all the way to another extreme of calling climate change the most pressing problem of human kind caused by greedy and reckless capitalism, and all kinds of space uh, between those two extremes uh, encompass the, the narratives. And evidence suggests, as you see with this slide, that these narratives are more important than the science. Big, big shocker, we're seeing this in the news especially if you turn in or tune in to uh, certain cable news networks, this is obvious. And there are lots of references here if you want a, a deeper dive on that. So what to do? Well, first we need to know what these narratives are. Uh, we need to understand that, that one of the ingredients of these, of these narratives are causal relationships and whether people want to feel culpable or the extent to which they want to experience blame. Another important ingredient are the intentions of the relevant actors. Who's going to be responsible? Who's going to get the blame? Who's going to be a bad guy or a good guy or a villain or a hero in the story? And third ingredient that's important is the effective and moral evaluation strategies. Who's going to have to actually do the work to mitigate um, climate change? So with all of that in mind, back to the brook trout, with the, the, the sort of twin sort of realities in terms of current conditions that, first of all, there's, that we need to be having probably as much or more as we currently have in terms of attention on climate change, and that there's an opportunity to reinvigorate and maybe even reinvent some of the fisheries extension in our department, one. And two, that all of this is happening at a time when fly fishing and angling in general are more popular than they have been in, in many decades. Some blame or, or attribute the uh, pandemic for that, whatever the reason, we're seeing more people engaged in angling. We're especially seeing more young people and women in, in, involved in, in fly fishing and, and, and trout and salmon, and cold water species. And there's also in tandem with that increasing interest around cold water itself in the Adirondacks and the plight of loon. So we've got, we've got some demand signal there to think about in terms of engagement. But then we've got this other reality and this, this is intended to provide a little levity, but also this is, this is real. You've got our favorite guy in his red plaid who wants to know what's going on with all this algae and, for example, Cayuga Lake. What's going on with the dead oysters? Why are my family members all fired up about dolphins and whales on the beach dead? Why does the fishing suck? What, what, you know, why is the river flooding all the time? But then they, somebody, and in this cartoon, a greenie, quote unquote, beats him over the head with the climate change science and the same guy puts on his red shirt with white letters and says, why should I believe in climate change? I think this is really important. 
This is probably among the most important lessons that we in extension, especially extension faculty, should be taking to heart. And the reason is, probably preaching to the choir a little too much. Probably spending a little bit too much time facing the choir and not walking out of the congregation or even out in the street, talking to the people who maybe don't need that sign beating them over the head, but certainly need to understand a way to have a relationship with an iconic species, a, a provocative one perhaps, so that they can get into a space where they can have these conversations and maybe even be in a position to have their climate narrative shaped, their ecological identities reformulated and so forth. So I would, I would forward that it's not enough to conduct extension and environmental education with those who are likely already agreeing with it. Given that, what I think we're, we're seeing with this Brook Trout project beyond you know, a handful of other interesting things going on with that project that I hope we'll have time to tell you about, re-engaging the hook and bullet crowd, which you know, we've kind of gotten away from across the board in natural resources uh, in, the, in this field, is important. Because if you can stop uh, engaging that audience from the standpoint of carbon dioxide data, or who, who, who you voted for, or what have you, and start talking more about impacts to species of fish and game that are most important to sportsmen and women, you can actually have productive conversations as, as I have um, recorded. So reminding everyone about the uh, original uh, workspace that I talked about, and now uh, re re refocusing that to, with all this, uh, energy, angst in, in, the, in, the, in the narrative, if you will, in our society, what can we do uh, to engage or re-engage rural New Yorkers, uh, people who live in the Adirondacks, for example, who are likely less open to climate science? What can we do? Can we meet the, those folks with differing climate narratives in a kind of neutral space like angling seems to be? <clears throat> where we can agree that we love a cherished natural icon and not talk about who politically is responsible for X, Y, and Z? Can we agree that we want that cherished iconic species like brook trout to persist? Can we leverage uh, these provocative social ecological icons, brook trout or others, I, I, would, I, would, I would forward, towards changed climate narratives, changed ecological identities, escaping ecological amnesia and so forth, and can we stimulate conservation behavior, behaviors among those that are initially rejecting climate change if that's how you approach the conversation? And to wit, in, in a couple of the interviews that I did, I, I found this happening a few times, and this one was most concise. And I'll show you a picture of talking with this angler about this at, a, at an event at the Wild Center. I was talking with him, he's like, man, it's gotta be hard to, to, to have conversations with anglers on the stream about climate change. And I said, well, it depends. It can be challenging, but you know, we gotta do it, right? And he kind of nodded. You could tell he was working his way through this. And he just kind of came out with this statement. He said, it's easier to say, I'm working to protect brook trout than it is to say, I believe in climate change. And you could watch him work, work his way through, you know, managing his narrative as it came out of his mouth. And so I felt like that, that's really important to recognize for those of us that are in the business of extending the work that scientists are doing here in this department and elsewhere, in the business of engaging and in the business of trying to create these pathways and portals and helping us understand how to be humans in nature. So we know that these fish that depend upon cold water, trout, salmon, char, et cetera, are under threat, particularly vulnerable. But we also recognize that these are among the most popular and sought after by anglers, as I mentioned. We have a, a pretty clear threat. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I can figure this out. And I carry a thermometer when I go fly fishing, and I know that the fish don't like it when it gets about 70 degrees or higher, especially the brook trout, uh, pretty stressed and uh, unlikely to, to, to um, persist in, in watersheds that I care about where they used to. And I know that other anglers and other people who appreciate fish that aren't anglers are seeing these and noticing these as worrying trends, almost independent of where they fall on the political spectrum around climate change narratives. So uh, one, one thing that this has led me to, and I think this is important for those of us that work in, in extension uh, lines of effort, is we, we got, we've got to kind of change the way we do business. Uh, we've got to be addressing some of these structural problems 
we need to serve as those scale crossing brokers more regularly. And then not just in a program like this, but I think in a, in a multitude of places where we can deploy ideas like this and actually work this side of the problem in, in social ecological systems where we seek out these sort of novel relationships or these novel mechanisms, where we identify inflection points and, and opportunities, like with the brook trout and talking with people about brook trout in the Adirondacks and sussing out their climate narratives and perhaps influencing them, and then imagining and creating some partnerships. So what I'm gonna do now in the remainder of my time is a little show and tell about what this project actually is doing. And hopefully you'll, you'll see kind of the, the point of what I'm getting to here. So first, um, extension, developing extension products is nothing new for many of you. The whole point of cooperative extension and extension is to extend the empirical science that's coming out of the land grant university, which is what we're doing. So in this particular case, um, we're trying to tell the story first, why are the brook trout so special? And for a lot of people, that's a given. For some tourists that are coming through the area, maybe it's not a given, but they're certainly on board once they understand this. And then we talk about how, how people can actually help, help promote uh, healthy, abundant brook trout. Now, this, this, this poster is also in brochure form. Uh, we did, we've, we've done a number of tabling events, which I'll get to. I'm very proud to say I'm starting to see this poster and the brochure in lots of fly fishing shops and sporting goods shops and hardware stores, and also in the various museums and public spaces around the Adirondacks. So, you know, I haven't measured, you know, the, the, the amount of adoption, but we certainly are seeing it out there, which is at least an initial indicator that the word is getting out around brook trout and that they're threatened by climate and that there may be possibilities to be proactive about that. So developing the extension products is an important component of this. Also, building campaigns with partners is an important component of this. And I think this is, this is a little bit innovative in terms of uh, how cooperative extension has done business in the past. We are working directly with these organizations, the Wild Center, the Adirondack Experience, Great Camp Sagamore. And um, <clears throat> we're working with them to integrate this notion of cold water fisheries as an opportunity for climate change education into their program. So that we in this department, both those, of, those fisheries experts at AFRP and those of us that are extending that knowledge uh, are, are part of the conversation and part of the production of their interpretation of what's happening for the public. The whole respect the spec campaign, this is a, <laughs> this is a pretty, this is very new. This is coming out of some brainstorming that's happening at Great Camp Sagamore, which is an amazing facility. If you haven't been there, I highly encourage you to, to check it out. The idea is uh, as a part of this project, there was a citizen science component. And that citizen science component was an angling bit where Anglers, citizens, were, were, were trying to determine whether there were brook trout that were not stocked in a particular watershed around Great Camp Sagamore. What they found out through this partnership with, with scientists is that the brook trout living around Sagamore in the watersheds at Sagamore Great Camp is a previously undescribed, it appears, heritage strain of brook trout. And that's pretty big, pretty big news uh, for everybody, and especially Great Camp Sagamore that sees an opportunity for education and even marketing to say, hey, you know, if we, if we say we should respect the way we do business and the way we treat water and, and, and gray water and waste because we have this special fish here, then we can also do additional education around that, wrap around, and even talk about climate change and, and climate narrative. So there's an example of leveraging these iconic species, these, these provocative social ecological icons in, 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 in the effort to uh, extend both the climate science and the conservation message around brook trout and cold water fisheries. <clears throat> we are also, uh, we conducted a number of extension activities wherein we were doing this preliminary research, including semi-structured interviewing and, and so forth. Um, the image here up on the left is that gentleman, and you'll notice at the time, this was a year ago, one of us is wearing a mask and some others are not. And, and, and there were are a number of points at the beginning of that conversation where this gentleman took the liberty of making sure I understood where he exists on the political spectrum. This is the same guy though, that said, it's a lot easier to talk about brook trout conservation than, than it is to talk about believing in climate science. And they, they, they were very interesting in terms of helping me understand the nuances of these climate narratives and how they're changing and being shaped 
in real time, depending on who people are talking to. Some of the other activities that were happening there, that, that happens to be at the, at the um, Blue Mountain Museum there, the Adirondack Experience. Um, they have a pond there that has brook trout in it. It's licensed by DEC, it's a stock pond. At the end of the year, they feel like a good thing to do with that is let youths and kids fish in it. So all these kids are running out of there with huge, huge brook trout. And, and, and they recognize with our help that that's a missed opportunity, a missed educational opportunity. So we use that occasion, that big fishing derby that they had, as a way to talk about this cold water fisheries and climate change uh, initiative. And it, in addition, we, we were able to talk about heritage strains and what's at threat and so on and so forth, which was, I think, very useful and also drove some traffic to Cornell Cooperative Extension and their growing expertise in this space in Hamilton County and in Herkimer County. And while all that was happening, while this tabling was happening, while this education was happening at the ponds, there was this other activity for very young people where the families could go over to this table. And there must have been a hundred of these little piggy banks that were white, hadn't been painted yet. And the youth were encouraged to paint whatever was on their mind after hearing some of this educational material. And they did, including that cute little bank there on the, on the lower left. And the idea was that there are investments that they can make in conservation and in, in an attempt to do some shaping of environmental uh, narratives and climate narratives and our ecological identity. So these are intended to be examples of conducting extension activities that are in support of larger efforts of AFRP and of other faculty uh, in this department. <clears throat> I think an important other benefit uh, is the fact that the bright light is actually being shown on what I think is a premier um, activity or, or accomplishment uh, here in our department, that is our fisheries competencies and our fisheries work. Um, it's for, for various reasons, it's kind of a bit of a secret that the Little Moose Field Station is, is where it is, <clears throat> and, and, but it shouldn't be a secret that they do great work and that there are important studies coming out of there having to do with climate change and cold water fisheries, not just brook trout, other fish too, and that, that we can do a good job of ensuring the longevity of their existence and an ability to do that work there by reaching out to the communities without jeopardizing important relationships, historical relationships in that part of the Adirondacks, and actually make the case that this is a, this is work that should be supported. So I think that's a that's icing on the cake in terms of this cooperative extension effort, in in that we are able to um, <clears throat> help uh, shine a brighter light on this important fisheries work that's happening. Um, you know, sort of behind the curtain is that I think we can do similar things with Oneida Lake and the Cornell Biological Field Station at Shackleton Point with warm water species. So we'll see how that works out. So what I'd like to do now <clears throat> in, in, in wrapping this up is just to show you one of the products that we are, are almost done developing as a way to continue this effort. And again, just to, to reiterate the sort of red thread through all of this is that what we're trying to do is recognize and acknowledge dissonant climate narratives as parts of ecological identities that can be shaped, that we can have an optimistic approach to, and we don't have to just throw our hands up in the air and give up on, on these audiences. So let me see if I can pull this off. So, um, really, the, the point in showing you that is to, to give you a, a sort of tangible 
notion of what, what, what I've been talking about since the beginning of this talk, really, which is this applied um, social science, applied environmental social science and engaged um, approach to thinking through humans in nature, the idea of human nature, and what we, how malleable that can be in terms of uh, climate narratives and how they relate to ecological amnesia, ecological identities, uh, avoiding ecological disenfranchisement, and so forth. I hope you've also taken away um, that handful of heuristics as at least uh, you know provocative, if uh, in terms of the theoretical and philosophical story tools. And I hope you've seen uh, an idea of how cooperative extension and extension practices can do some things a little differently now and should do things a little differently now with the challenges that we face uh, moving forward. I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension Innovation Fund folks, of course, Cliff and Pete and the AFRP staff have been great to work with and work through this approach, um, sort of multidisciplinary and, and multi-pronged approach. Also, we've had great partners in, in Cornell Cooperative Extension counties like Herkimer and Hamilton and Garrett Livermore and Jimmy Page and in Warren County with John Bow. And I also want to thank, um, especially for that last video, the Cornell Cooperative Extension admin folks in the media department, RJ Anderson and Petunia. And most importantly, I would like to thank all of you for uh, listening to this, this, this talk. And I hope that you will uh, have some questions and that you will find something of use that you can take with you going forward. And I think that's time for questions. So thank you very much. Questions. I think there is very good likelihood from a couple of different venues. I, I think there is, there are a number, and can, and Pete might be able to talk to you a little bit more about some of the, the, you know, more hardcore fisheries and empirical work that's happening that drives the attention of this. But I think there's some really good chances for some of that funding to happen through uh, federal formula funds and other mechanisms. But this notion of climate narratives and climate identities and ecological identities is also gaining some traction. Um, there's a, there's a, a pool of people who are thinking about the implications of climate smart communities and some of these funding streams that are out there. And they're actually concerned that a lot of this is kind of city and regional planning focused and not focused on rural folks or, you know, consumptive uses or the old school, you know, those folks that are, you know, resource dependent. And I think there's a pretty strong likelihood that there's some funding opportunities there. I've, I've, I've heard already interest in that. And then I will also say that in those museums, there's a great interest in helping to interpret their kind of dated understandings of humans in nature and humans in the Adirondacks and so forth, which I think is an important part of that story too. And they've, they've already offered, two of those two museums have already offered to, you know, get together and, and collaborate and funding is a part of that from there. So I think the, there are some opportunities in, in some of this. Thank you. So that question was likelihood of future funding, obviously. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that question. And, and just to kind of summarize it, you know, why the brook trout versus other species that others in the Adirondacks may be beginning to appreciate more. Um, the answer is yes, it's a little bit of a, a uphill push. I think that the effort here is, and, and maybe I, I, I got to do a better job of communicating this, I want this to be a template, a model for, for, for we could do this with lots of species, 
in a project before this, we did some survey work. You helped me with this in the, um, at the time ATO, you helped me with this, looking at what do people in the Adirondacks actually say is iconic symbol to them. And we heard bear and we heard moose and we heard conifer forests and we heard cold isolated lakes up high and we heard 46 peeps. So there are a number of things that resonate with people in terms of this, this place that they have attachment to and the place uh, icons that help them have that sense of place and time. But that's the, 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 the reason that I particularly wanted to talk about cold water fisheries and climate change is because that appears to be most dire, despite people saying, oh, well, it'd be easier just to deal with bass because they're gonna be around if the water warms up, no problem. And I think the other thing that as we hopefully get more funding will help us to move forward thinking through is, doing a better job of communicating the ecological relationships that are implied by there being brook trout there in terms of forest health, you know, all, all the sort of ecological ramifications of cleaner cold water as they come to be. So appreciating your question and also recognizing that for many people, it might not resonate the way it does for somebody in the Pequot community, as I'm sure you, I know that you do. Um, it, it, it is true that we will have to make these kinds of cases in lots of different places, part of my, reason for bringing up Oneida Lake is that I, I think we have to do similar things with similar approaches, acknowledging the importance of using our expertise to shape these narratives and, and enter into conversations with audiences that we're kind of ignoring a little through our, 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 our own uh, threat. Thanks for that question. how to deal with it, but I suspect that people that, that care a lot about walleye can talk about the qualitative and quantitative differences between what walleye need and what largemouth bass need. Um, and I think that, you know, again, you know, for communicating this to an angler audience or, you know, sort of a lay audience, I think that, you know, the, the main thing I hope people take away from this talk is that it's been done already. These deploying these, these, these provocative social ecological icons has already been done and to some success. The, the polar bear or the whatever, all right? But as has been rightly pointed out, those things are very exotic and far, far away. We've got to do a good job of having those conversations about those fish or those wildlife in our own systems so that that level of, 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 of you know, the narrative and our ecological identities can be shaped by our ecosystems right here. So I would, I would love to talk with Lars and others about, you know, how we, how we shape that message from the standpoint of extension and applied and engage research in order to, to have that conversation in systems other than where brook trout operate. Appreciate the question, Lars. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so, you know, there's a big push right, thank you for that question. There's a big push right now in terms of program evaluation teams from cooperative extension. We have what I think are kind of shaky post-program evaluations where people will hurry up and scribble and out the door they go. Um, so that's not good enough. I think the, the right way to do that is to have professionals in, in program evaluation actually preload what, what we're gonna actually measure for these programs and, and then and do the evaluation so that we can, and I think that back in the 70s, extension probably did a way better job at program evaluation than, than we do now, frankly, that seems to just have gotten lost. So I think the best way is not in my area of expertise necessarily, although I hope to gain some of this expertise, and that is to utilize state-of-the-art in program evaluation um, techniques and, 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 and some of them are electronic, some of them are not, and then actually push papers out that say, here's, here's the actual evaluation of this program, and then we approve, improve the programs accordingly based on what they say on the paper. Uh, there is a, there is, I appreciate that question so much because we just, we, the senior extension associates around the CALS department just successfully advocated for a program evaluation staff person in cooperative extension administration to address exactly that, that question. So, you know, I don't have the answer as to how we would do that for this, but I hope to have an expert soon that I can sit down with and figure out what that evaluation programmatically would be. Yes, 
think that we can't neglect the youth element because that's the future of conservation and a lot of the things that we care about. But I also think, out of the same at the same time, that neglecting the voters right now it, it will set us up for failure if we if we actually don't do the work that I'm talking about, which is the return to engaging the quote unquote hook and bullet crowd and actually try to find ways to have these conversations. I think that the the cards will get the, the deck will get stacked in such a way that the young people will have insurmountable problems to try to confront. So I think you got to continue to do both. Actually, I think you got to do more of the adult education and extension and outreach around these things in our community without diminishing our youth program. I think that that is a potential outcome. I think the idea right now, and this is so very sort of nascent, is that you know the conservation community is is becoming, I would say, victimized by this false innovation of red and blue stuff. And and we have got to hurry up and get out of that problem. So the way I think you do that is by talking about what people cherish and love, and helping them be able to be comfortable themselves to have a conversation about how a changing climate is affecting the things that they love, the creatures they love, and the activities they love. And if, if we can't do that at the local, it'll be real hard to do that at the regional, state, and federal level. But I do believe that the effort that went into the hunting, recruitment, retention, and reactivation world, which seemed to have some success on the margins anyway, we could do the same with this kind of activity and probably need to do the same. One of the things that I'm, I'm doing uh, as an aside that I didn't talk about in today's talk is I've, I've set up a clearinghouse of peer-reviewed journal articles that are about climate change and game and fish species that people care about. So whenever those guys at the sportsman's clubs say, ah, you know, there's no science to back that up, there's, there's a growing database now of where there is that science and it's organized in a way that, you know, the guys at the club, the sportsman's club, who are the people we need to do some outreach to, um, can actually access that information and, and have, have, their, have their climate narratives influenced and their ecological identities, you know, addressed. I can't go very much further than that in terms of broader policy, but I can say that in this advisory committee that I am serving on, the secretary, the undersecretary for outreach and whatever in DOI is certainly interested in what needs to happen in this community. So I appreciate the question. If you've got ideas, voting or otherwise, you know, let's let's talk. Okay, it's, it's 4.30. I'm happy to, to uh, answer as many questions as people have, but I also want to be respectful of others' time and um, commitment. Yay. All right, one more question. What do we got? Thank you. I had a feeling that Steve would ask this question. I'm glad that he asked the question. And my answer is, I don't know. But I hope that he and I can have a conversation where we talk about that. My, my, my hunch in saying I don't know is that, you know, when, when I deal with one of the hats I wear is as, as the vice president of the New York State Conservation Council, I talk with DEC managers all the time. And they express a lot of frustration about, you know, lock-in and task dependency and the problems of bureaucracy. And, and even some of these larger I ideas that Stephen would be very familiar with in terms of labor and, and capital and where it is and how you unlock it. So my, my, my retort would be to, to Steve and others uh, thinking about those sorts of sort of larger systemic issues is that we, we need to think about that. There hasn't been a lot of cooperative extension or extension that is extending what he just said. 
but we can do that. We should do that. So I would invite him and others in that in that area to think through what does extension look like in that space. And I'm open to that as, as however much I can do it. And I know there are others in other departments that would welcome that too. And I, I do appreciate that question, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I will respond to him, but oh. and <laughs> I thank you all very much for your questions and for your attention, and I look forward to being a happy hour with you. Thank you. My daughter, Victoria.